report that there's no, no action taken during the closed session. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order then, if everybody will stand for the request list. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, item G, communications. Uh, our student representative is not uh, able to attend tonight, so we have our superintendent's report. Okay. Hey. Dio, you have a little bit of it, huh? Yeah.
not even to go visit the schools to investigate problems brought to your attention. Leadership is an active process. There are two issues that we're going to talk about. One is the preparation for WASC's accreditation and the graduation of students. Last month, the Brown Act was violated when I was told that I could only ask questions, so I'm speaking on WASC from last month. The WASC, the WASC self-study is an 18-month process. As the head counselor last year, I brought WASC to Mr. Messman's attention each and every month. I worked through the chain of command, and Mr. Johnson knew about the problems. He had the study rescheduled. The self-study for this rescheduled visit should have started in May of 2013, not in January of 2014. I also brought my concerns uh, regarding WASC to the school board's attention in the fall, and it just started in January. Two weeks ago, the WASC presentation by Mr. Mespin was a classic example of smoke and mirrors. He presented nothing of substance. I have attached sample documents from the WASC website for you to look at. And here is a list of problems. There is no timeline. The WASC cannot be accomplished without concrete goals. An 18-month collaborative <coughs> process cannot be completed in April, May, August, and September. That is the blue document. The evidence boxes were handed out in the beginning of March. Evidence is crucial to the WASC evaluation, but the boxes are empty. That's the white document. Teachers have not received the 137 questions, or as WASC calls them, prompts, that need answering by the focus groups. I gave you the first two pages of categories A and C, and there are five categories that make up the focus groups. That's me. There are no, there is no plan for teachers to visit each other's classroom as required by WASC. That's a pink document. Involvement by all stakeholders is a major component of the WASC process. No parents, students, or board members have attended any focus group meetings. You saw pictures of the focus group committees. They are not balanced and the group assignments were given out in the middle of January with a revised list mid-March, not in October of last year when the process should have started. If you look at the color chart, I created the top chart which is an example of what the balance should be for the loss committee. <coughs> it was easy to do. Mr. Messman created the lower chart. Mr. Messman has given Mrs. Dabbs the title of the loss coordinator, but none of the authority. Mr. Messman blames her for all of the problems related to loss. This lack of action for loss preparation is a failure of leadership by the principal. And for your benefit, in your documents, you have the, the WASP website. It's very easy to find all the documentations you need. Second, I speak about the Fillmore High School seniors in danger of not graduating. I want to make it clear that I have not spoken to the high school counselors because I do not want them to be the target of retribution. From school board members, I have been told that 58 seniors are in danger of not graduating due to not meeting the math requirements. That is 30% of the senior class of 2014. For comparison, in last year's class, only three students who did not, did not graduate. What happened? Succinctly, a poorly thought out change in policy caused this disaster. In the spring of 2013, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Mespin, Mrs. Lyon, and I met twice to discuss the changes in mathematics. I provided Mr. Johnson with the information he requested about students who would be adversely affected, including names. There were 112 names on that list. Those 112 students represent one half of the senior of last year's junior class. Despite knowing the adverse impact on one half of the junior class, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Messman went ahead with their policy changes. After exhausting the path through the chain of command, I presented this information to the school board in the spring of 2013 and again in the fall. 
Six weeks into the school year, the failure of the policy changes became clear and the requirement for Algebra II was dropped. However, the policy of not allowing two math classes at the same time remained in place. It is this policy that has jeopardized the graduation of many of these 58 seniors. Since I do not ask the counselors for information, I can only use documents that I have from the end of last year. I created a spreadsheet for Mrs. Sanchez, the new Fillmore High School counselor, which gave her all of the graduation status for each senior with the last name starting A through L. For evidence, I have a cop attached a copy for you. This is only a list of students, and obviously their names are not listed, but their IDs are, um, who need two or three math classes in order to graduate. This has 30 students on it for half of the alphabet. So you can figure that at this time, there were about 60 students who still needed two or three math classes and the policy prevented them from doing that. There are undoubtedly other factors besides math which contribute to the number of students in danger of not graduating. I am not aware of these academic issues. However, I do know from speaking to students that there is no school spirit. Seniors are in a tailspin of failure and depression. Fear of failure breeds failure. And that is the pervasive emotion at Thelma High School for both students and staff. I wish I could put more before you than just na numbers of students in jeopardy of not graduating. Showing you their faces would drive home the point. Without a graduation diploma, their lives would put on hold. Some may have wanted to join the armed forces, probably, possibly to be Navy SEALs, but they will not be able to fulfill their dreams. This lack of support for students is a failure of leadership by the principal. Board members, you have been presented with hard evidence on the following for the past few weeks and months. Mr. Messman has not acted effectively on loss. Mr. Messman has not acted effectively on graduation problems. Mr. Messman has not acted effectively and has lied to the school site council. Mr. Messman is not a leader. Mr. Messman has never had the skills to lead Fillmore High School. Board members, the path forward is clear. Leadership is an active process. You need to act. Place Mr. Maskin on administrative leave and bring in an interim principal until a new superintendent can hire a principal for Fillmore High School. You are the top of the chain of command. You are the leaders of the Fillmore Unified School District. And it is time to become the active leaders you were voted to be. Thank you. Dr. Barbara Nakasone, and I wrote a letter to the uh, Fillmore Gazette, and I sent a copy to each of the board members. And I thought that since I was someone who is outside of town, that you would like to see who it is who thought uh, they were cheeky enough to make a comment upon what was going on at Fillmore. <laughs> I think you remember from the letter that my grandparents had a boarding house here in Fillmore. And it's my understanding that they housed railroad workers in their boarding house. And I'm always struck when I come into town how much that your California pioneer town looks like the California pioneer town that my dad raised me in. My dad wasn't able to stay in Fillmore, so I wasn't born here and I wasn't raised here. I came here often because my dad still had friends here. And I have a heartfelt desire to make sure that Fillmore is a high-performing school with high-performing students. One thing that I would like to encourage is that in the midst of change, it is difficult when you raise standards and when more is expected of you now than has been expected of you in the past. And sometimes it gets scary and sometimes students have to gear up. And sometimes we have to go before school and after school to make sure that we're prepared for the world that's out there. My dad's education and my education was very much the same. 
My daughter's education was very different from mine. And when I'm looking at what my grandkids are doing, oh my Lord, they're doing so much, so much more in a tech, technical and digital world. I think we forget sometimes that we're not raising students here in Fillmore to compete with Santa, Santa Paula or Ventura or Camarillo. We're raising students here that are going to compete around the world. Singapore, Tokyo, Berlin, name any major city in the world. We often forget that China has more advanced students than we have students. My son-in-law happens to be a, an entrepreneur with successful businesses. And he walked into my kitchen one day and he said, I worry what country my boys are going to have to go to in order to find a job. My dad had to leave Fillmore and go to another pioneer town. He worked for the railroad. It's the same kind of railroad that's sitting down here. My children weren't able to stay in the town that I raised them in, and I have one on both coasts. We are challenged that our students, with probably a lot less money than some of the neighboring districts, are going to have to compete in the same world market. It's going to be like Moneyball, that uh, movie that Brad Pitt did on the change of how they did Major League Baseball. And the point of that movie wasn't so much that the Oakland A's went and won the World Series. What it was is that they took a, a ball team that had a very low financial backing and made them compete equally with ball teams that had far more money than they had. They equaled the, the playing field. Because it wasn't any longer how pretty you were, how great your form was, or how many times you got to be interviewed by the public. What start, started to matter was how many, time you, how many times you got on base. We are teaching our students the essentials with probably a very limited budget, and then we are teaching them to compete on a world market. I'm proud that I have roots in Fillmore. I'm proud every time I come to, into town, every time I see the railroad, every time I see the hills, and I walk along the streets and I find so many friendly people. I wish I could have been raised here, but I wasn't. But I want to encourage you to continue to bring in the best performing people that you possibly can bring, and you've brought that team here. They have a record of performance. Was it happy everywhere they were? Probably not. Was everybody content? Probably not. But the results were there. We often bring in outside people and the best and people who didn't grow up here to be our doctors, to be our police chiefs, to be the ones that are the city planners. We bring in other people who weren't raised here. And we bring them in to improve us, to evaluate us, and to show us what we need to do to get ourselves competing in a wide world market. You're doing a great job, and it's a brave job, and it has a moral imperative to it. So we are going to be standing with you whether we're sitting here in Fillmore or I'm sitting in Campbell, California. I'm still pulling for Fillmore High School. Thank you. Okay, um, is Karen, I know we are uh, Erica, is Erica coming in, Erica Garcia? Okay, moving on then to um, item I, information and discussion. Uh, you want to go ahead, uh, Michael, and introduce those? Yes, uh, there are a couple of items here that we would like to update the board on. One is on bullying, what we're doing with bullying. Um, so we did that in cyberbullying. Uh, also harassment, uh, under the umbrella of harassment. We'd like the board to be updated on that. As a follow-up on the presentation by the lawyer, uh, last time we had a regular meeting. So I've asked uh, Carol and Gary to come up and uh, share this particular piece of information with the board. And then I'll give an overview on the second item having to do with ACES.
Cyberbullying, and uh, there's also a, a reference to cyberbullying as digital drama, and we're not going to use that, but I'll just leave it at that right now. And again, kind of carrying on with the harassment paradigm, willful and repeated harm, um, per perpetrated through the use of computers, cell phones, and electronic devices, and um, again, that intent to harass, threaten, intimidate, and humiliate can be very devastating. There's a foundation to that as we look at the relationship of our laws. And uh, suffice it to say, as we look at SB 77, 89, uh, maybe 1156, you'll see the progression through the years. There are a lot of laws, but essentially, uh, I believe that they can be kind of understood in, the, in their impact as far as legislating that schools, districts develop responsible policies, uh, follow laws uh, consistently. Um, they, they review their processes uh, annually and they include those um, in their safe school plans. So there's constant vigilance, monitoring, and compliance. That follows with board policy, and um, fortunately, uh, Ms. Berenger is the, is the author of, of many things here, including that board policy. Uh, it does establish that bullying is not tolerated. It, it does direct <coughs> stakeholders to develop anti-bullying strategies, and then if you look at three critical areas, defining areas of uh, prevention, intervention, a very thorough uh, complaints investigation process, accountability for those, and that lead to carefully thought out consequences. It's a very emotional issue, obviously, but we need to follow due process responsibly. Moving into the prevention and intervention areas, um, we have made available and have distributed 
again last year, uh, there's an educator's guide to bullying prevention, and I have a copy to hand out here. I can pass that on if you like. Um, and that went to all of our staff members. Another one, uh, cyberbullying identification, prevention, and response to our staff, teachers, and encouraging them to, to share lessons or to do those classes. And also at secondary, and Darn and I, I meant to get these out to, to elementary too more so, but it really is really focusing on teens. And there's this poster here that is in the secondary classrooms uh, responding to cyberbullying and cyber safety and the, the top ten the top ten tips for teens at secondary level. Also addressing another area that we can do further. There are some programs that we have made available that we will be looking at and for further um, development and implementation. Um, second step, um, it's a social skills uh, training program. It's really, uh, really, really very nice. Um, primarily for K-5, um, and it really does teach social-emotional interaction, appropriate uh, interaction with, uh, with our K-5 graders. Wonderful. Um, CHAMPS really is, and it, it, it is uh, primarily a classroom management program that also, according to research, some people would cite the research is that uh, it shows um, where it's been used wide, you know, on a widespread basis, increases in uh, student achievement and decreases in negative you know, behavior situations. And so the acronym, and I put those uh, little notes there so I wouldn't forget. So a uh, conversation. You know, what, what is acceptable talk? How, um, how do, what, what's, what are ways that students can gain help? How do they get teachers' attention? Activity, what are the tasks, objectives, and outcomes that we're looking for? Um, movement, can students move? What's acceptable? Participation, if we look at focusing on the focus student behavior and engagement, what does that look like? And then if those steps are, are followed, then they lead to success. Uh, important consideration for the programs we're going to look at interventions, direct interventions as well, but there's a lot of emphasis on impacting the school climate and the real positive uh, gains that, that people um, report to school climate. And these are programs that address school climate. Um, coincidentally, and to our advantage really, the Children's Internet Protection Act uh, in 2012 has now mandated that this year we have to pilot, uh, pilot uh, a program on digital citizenship. Uh, I would credit, um, if I could, Lori Merrill actually has been really working on that in her STEM program, and I remember when, we, when that was set up last year, and she's done a good job on that. But we met with Dan at Greenspan in terms of this, uh, this uh, program. And really, it's a, it's a, a approved by VECO, Mentor County Office of Education, and it um, is online, it uh, covers grades K through 12, and we're required this year as a pilot uh, to um, select, or sites will help select, one grade level, one classroom, one grade level per site, and there are six package lessons in there. We will um, likely focus on two of them, and again, one of those uh, deals directly with cyberbullying, so it's a really great exposure and introduction from grade K on up through 12 that they'll get an exposure to an area of, of a serious concern for us that we want to make sure that we address. Um, mentioned here the acceptable use policy, and again, I could say that Ms. Berenger updated our policies. She did. And um, the current update um, request is to collect signatures once a year on the updated AUPs from students. There's a student form and a staff form. And there's a direct impact on the E-rate rate, which we are charged for access to and use of internet access and so forth. Um, so you see there's a flow from uh, the laws, policies, and I mentioned it, and investigation, procedural steps, again, a uh, site, main source in terms of bullying harassment, intimidation, and discrimination policy. It, it does a thorough job of describing the expectations for student behavior and our responsibility as a staff for responsible intervention. It does uh, really 
firmly established conditions that affect student outcomes and explains the steps and process of, of uh, reporting these incidents in a very timely and responsible manner with accountability. And actually, I could show, could project uh, the forms on the, on the screen. But I want to share the forms that, that have been delivered to each of the schools. Um, and uh, it really does, uh, they're quite, uh, the investigation resolution of bullying, harassment, intimidation, discrimination. Um, it identifies the aggressor, identifies the witnesses, and the targets, um, you know, and, and uh, reports the findings. Uh, I'll, I'll pass this around. I can, I, yeah, I can't can project it later. It talks about the action taken really, really quite thorough in, in its documentation and uh, recording and, and accountability. There are uh, forms in English and Spanish and, uh, and forms that are kept in the office for reporting by students and parents, so it's uh, really quite comprehensive. Yeah, the only thing I'll say about this is this is just site-based, but under the, the laws for bullying, you do, um, you can go through a uniform complaint policy if it's not resolved at the site. So there are multiple layers to a, to a complaint if necessary. Hopefully, it's resolved always after the cycle. And as we look at consequences, there are really uh, important factors that we need to consider uh, before determining the appropriate consequence. And uh, we can recall last week's presentation by uh, our attorney, Aaron, and this relates to that, that really prior to uh, consequencing uh, our parties, that there really must be given important consideration for the uh, levels of uh, developmental and maturity levels of our parties that are involved, the, the degree of harm, harm committed, the, the, the circumstances, the surrounding circumstances, the type of behavior, the nature exactly, and uh, the history of, of, of past uh, incidents or uh, similar patterns, continued patterns of behavior, the relationship between the parties. Uh, we were happily joking about girlfriend, boyfriend, but best friends, and what's the context there in which the incidents occurred. And then all of these factors really must be taken into account in providing due process. Um, and that sometimes makes it quite challenging before um, the consequences are, are uh, exacted. Further legal requirements. And, and these are ed code um, so, uh, sections that are listed actually on our suspension sheet, and that can result in uh, multiple days, one through five days of uh, suspension for our assessment policy. Uh, but I, I, again, I do want to point out, and this is sometimes, again, and this is really a due process, uh, especially now, in the world, that um, it, it does state quite clearly that uh, that suspension shall be imposed only when other means of correction fail to bring about proper conduct. However, um, there is a uh, the understanding that any um, violation of a 4900 code can lead to um, suspension of that particular consideration. But here, here's examples, and you see how they do address harassment. And you can see that on the harassment, sorry, uh, complaining witness, 4900R, active bullying, including but not limited to electronic means, so that includes the cyber bullying. Component. Two others here. Um, here's our reference to sexual harassment uh, against other uh, district staff personnel or pupils. And then, um, well, okay, and then uh, engaged in harassment, threats, or intimidation also with uh, district personnel. It, it widens it to uh, more uh, general, more general harassment. And again, in reference to AB 1729, and I, I believe this reflects a little bit on the the school climate aspect, and how that's becoming such a, a strong push for that. Um, it does define us to test the, the fighting other means of support, finding that balance. Obviously, we want to have accountability at the same time uh, as um, actually a statewide uh, suspension and expulsion rates are dropping uh, because of the changes in the laws and so forth. But that these means of support must be age appropriate and they, and they must address 
and make the effort to correct some misbehavior. Such examples, and, uh, and if we do have these. Um, I know that they are in place um, at, 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 at sites. Um, I'm not sure on what consistency, uh, how consistently that might be, but uh, conferencing, housing, conflict resolution, um, restorative justice uh, is that effort to to return a situation between disputants, combatants, or whatever to, a, a, to some sense of normalcy where there's some sort of uh, your, your teaching, positive interaction, you know, I've heard examples such as you, know, you, you, you go through social skills training, they have lunch together, or something of as simple as that potentially. And in general, these sorts of uh, positive approaches have a label of positive intervention, positive intervention support, PAS, and uh, both uh, second step and uh, champs are uh, just those sorts of uh, approaches, programs. And the restitution, that's payback, not payback, <laughs> to, uh, but payback by uh, paying for the window you just broke. You dirty rat. So um, we're fortunate we do have uh, resources. In, in particular this year, uh, I've had the opportunity to really, uh, and I know some of uh, our colleagues were attending these, but uh, I know that we're now partners with this CalTrip grant. Um, the money's coming in. I know that there's a partnership with the uh, Sheriff's Department, um, some of the community agencies, um, and it, we're focused on secondary. Uh, I know that uh, our staff is involved, but it does increase the counseling. It does target um, other agencies as well to provide you know, uh, some educational opportunities for a, a targeted number of youth and then with the goal to, to decrease um, misconduct it does it again it does include the sheriff our SRO um, again I appreciate DECO or Victor County Office of Education their input um, they're providing some of our champs training right now uh, at, the, at the middle school uh, in particular and uh, some of our elementary or all of the elementary sites have had an opportunity to participate on some of the orientations um, the SIPA compliance program digital citizenship very timely I'm happy to have that opportunity to help out with Amber and if she's working so hard right now doing so many other things. I'm glad to kind of kind of chip in a little bit there and also with Mike Pace and the uh, and the tech people because uh, working hard against that. And then uh, again, there's an anti-bullying online training program that we're kind of policy, uh, that we're piloting now. We don't have a lot of people on that, but I believe five or six people. Um, we're kind of looking at it to see if it's something that we may. It does result in a, a certificate and questions of whether or not we might consider that. Uh, after we've taken that, and I believe through the uh, through the April um, month of April, we'll have the opportunity to take that and get them certified. Uh, any questions of the board? Um, I just want to know if we have um, researched any other programs because I know in Northern California district. I can't remember the name of it right now, but one of the conferences I went to, they concept there's a program that concentrated on students who are bystanders, who are watching kids being bullied, and the fact that if you can educate that group of students, you know, to right away stop, you know, not allow it to happen, that that brings down the bullying issues a lot. And so I just wondered if we had researched any of those, because I know, um, in fact, I saw um, Sarah Hansen at, the, at Bonds about three or four months ago, and she, uh, asked, you know, they had presented $12,000 to the district for bullying, and I just wondered if that was something that, you know, that we couldn't do so that we don't just concentrate on the, the victims and the bullying, but if we can get the majority of the students, instead of just standing there watching, to step in, you know, that that would make a major difference. Most, most of the programs have something some piece of it that talks to the bystanders um, it's it, it really is talking about training everyone training the adults in the area training the students that are being bullied and our victims working with the bullies to, to curb that but also what the, the bystanders what their responsibilities are as well and almost and most of the programs I've looked at do do um, work on that or address that issue and certainly a lot of the programs that you get coming into the schools that aren't a program you buy but you know those those like 
I can't remember what the one was up north I liked a lot. They they always address it. So they're, that's that's something they're very aware of. And Amber put a, sent out an email with a, an article from um, Edutopia, and it talks about the six R's, and that's one of the six R's. And so it's definitely something that, that we do need to make sure is addressed. Um, it actually was on the brochure that you just put. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's in there. Yeah. 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 Yes. And, and, what I think, and, and what I think needs to happen is we just need to be very deliberate. I, I know you were here when we started the sexual harassment, so I know you remember. <laughs> and through that being very deliberate about the message you sent, it made a big difference in kids' behavior toward each other on, on that subject. We were ha I, I, mean, I just remember so many incidents prior to that and after that when kids knew what their responsibilities were and how they were supposed to behave and what the expectations were, it changed everything. And I, So I think with the bullying, it's more than just um, putting out a few trifolds or, you know, it's, it's, it's making a concerted effort whether it's something that teachers may get, have an agreement to, to address every day in the bulletin, whether and something as simple as that, or or we or and we commit to you know once a quarter a period or some amount of time we go through something to do with with bullying or sexual harassment and pulling that piece in because <coughs> that's one of those pieces we don't want to lose. It's a law. So <clears throat> I think it's just a matter of being very, very deliberate while we also look for a program that, like you're talking about, that might offer us a much wider um, uh, variety oh, thank you, of training, you know, for, for teachers, for students. Right. Right. So well, and, yes. and it's for all employees. Because a custodian yes. can yes. be something or a secretary or somebody, yes. yeah. Absolutely. Um, Lucy, I think it, it might also help. Um, I know that um, since we received that grant, it might also help to kind of get a report at some point where that grant money has been spent so that they, you know, we report back. Essentially, when people do something nice like that, you know, I think it would be good to let them know how that money is being spent. I did, I did share, I did have the opportunity to talk with uh, Ms. Hansen and she has a colleague with her, who is her colleague. We did sit down about it, uh, yeah, not quite a month ago. We kind of shared with her where we're going, where we'd like to go. Okay. And also to address, I know it's on there, I was looking at one of the lessons on Second Step, because I had to learn a little bit about it. It was quite impressed. And it's exactly what it talks about, that everybody has responsibility. It's not just, you know, between the bully, the perpetrator, <coughs> and the victim, but it really involves uh, the responsibility for all. There's a real strong point they make about the difference between telling, reporting, and cattling. Right. Telling, reporting is not cattling. There's a big lesson on that. Right. So, okay. How do you approach this with the high school kids? Uh, they tend to be more uh, jaded. Pardon? <laughs> jaded. Jaded. <laughs> uh, when, right. when I was talking about that just a minute ago, I think it's really the the kids that need to hear it and, and hear it over and over and over again are probably your secondary students. They don't they don't want the cutesy pie program that they're going to hear about once a week or once a month. They just need to know this is unacceptable behavior and this is what will happen to you if you continue to go down that path. Um, I know that, well, I think you were here when they introduced the sexual harassment piece as well. And that was just simply everybody agreeing from, when I, out of Piru, I know we started in kindergarten not talking about sexual harassment, but talking about, you know, being able to tell somebody no if you didn't like something or stop. You know, just those simple, two simple words. And it also works with bullying. But I, I, I and then when you got into third, fourth, and fifth grade, it was much more about you know, that interaction between two kids that might be labeled sexual harassment. And I did notice, not being at the high school, you may have noticed something different, but I did notice that kids really knew what it was, they really understood what it was, and they really made an effort to not go down that road, and all the kids knew. So they knew you weren't gonna block a girl walking down the hallway or grab her or, you know, some of those things that that 
that kids think are funny and don't stop to think about because we don't teach them that that's not acceptable. So with high school, it may be less fun, but I think we need the material that's in their face. Maybe not every day of the week, well, actually, but very often. Let me give you an example. We had a problem <clears throat> at Moore Park High School with the word gay. Um, yes. Oh, that Absolutely. is so gay. Yes. And just using it over and over again in the class by kids, whether in the classroom or outside the classroom. And we made a commitment that each one of our that each one of our teachers for one week, every period, every day for that one week, at the beginning of the period and at the end of the period. A minute before the period, after the period started, and a minute before the period was over, that we would brainwash them with this idea that you cannot use the word gay, and this is why. And the reason was we had gay students at the high school that were contacting the Rainbow Coalition, and of course they came in, they in service our staff, and before they left they said, if you don't do something about it, we are threatening you with a lawsuit. And that's when we decided that for one week, Monday through Friday, every period, twice, it was, they were gonna get this intense talk, not discussion, but you can't do this because of this. You can't use that word because of this. And, and it will not be tolerated. And you're right, because that's exactly what research shows, is that it, it, it takes the adults, it takes everyone, not even just adults, it takes everyone making that effort. Whether you're an adult member of that staff on that campus, any staff member, or a bystander as a student watching this going on, <clears throat> every single person needs to know how to, how to step in and intervene, and what the steps are they need to take. And, and and just that message that this isn't acceptable because then when kids decide they want to behave that way, there are people around them that don't think that's okay behavior. And that's, that's exactly right. What a message the teachers on that campus sent. And it's very powerful when that happens. I'm not sure we've quite gotten there yet, but that's the place we want to be. And that's the place we need to go. And then we just need to have very clear messages we send. I think that's the bottom line with that. I, just, I want to share one example. Um, uh, when you say, how are we addressing this, perhaps at the secondary level, most high school. And this is a real, and this is, I think, one of the only two situations I've dealt with. And, and, and there is accountability. Um, again, we're dealing with uh, a young lady who was very hesitant to report and actually had claimed that she had made certain reports to her parents and mother father. Um, very serious, but we opened up the communications in a very confidential manner, in a manner which she felt safe and protected, involved the middle school staff. I give a lot of credit to, to Scott and Bev. And actually what we found out, we looked at evidence, because we had to go through the conditions, qualifying conditions, and really the degree of harm was quite severe and serious, and they exacted some very serious consequences. There were some suspensions and, and uh, that, uh, that resulted, so that's that accountability um, that, that perhaps we deal with in a little bit more straightforward manner at times uh, at the secondary level. At the secondary level also, it is crucial to, to develop a culture where students are able to talk to adults, that it's not snitching, it doesn't have, you know, somebody else, that they can talk about it. Beyond that, the adults, at the high school also need to understand that every report has to be taken seriously. Every report has to be taken seriously and followed up. And then the third piece is the swiftness of addressing the issue. At the secondary level, it's a little bit more subtle the way they do it because of uh, technology, devices that's available. It's a little bit more subtle, but it's part of it. If there's a culture that says it's okay to tell us anything that's happening on campus or off campus okay to do that and then no adults are going to respond to it and take it seriously then it allows you know for those things to be diminished not eliminated I haven't seen any sign any high school that's completely eliminated but diminishing uh, 
you know, that level. Any other comments? I think. Uh, uh, what, what I would like to, to say is that the, the report you have heard is impressed upon the board as it just really is. It's a national issue, and there's places in our country where, you know, it's been tragic, the outcome. And so I'd like you to feel comfortable and knowledgeable that we are seriously addressing this issue. We're not yet there perfectly, but we're doing everything we can to, to address it. Uh, we're happy for the funding that came in. Uh, we're constantly in communication in our department to come up with a systemic approach. Because we do not want to invest the money in this program here, a program there, a program here. We wanted to take a look at that money. It's one time expense to look at a systemic approach that whether the money is there or not, we can continue it. Uh, the challenge for us in finding a program is how much time will it take to roll it out? How much time will it involve in terms of the classroom process? And what do we give up? And so that's always a challenge for us. And that's where we are. That's a discussion in that services. So we're looking at that. And because of the significance of this issue, we have really asked Carol, who has expertise in this, to continue working with us. Because we cannot slip in this particular area. Every issue has to be dealt with cleanly and procedurally correct. And Carol has the expertise in that. Uh, and we've asked her to continue to make sure that we are on the right path in addressing this particular piece. Uh, now, moving into the next area. Which has Just to one second. I want to make yes. a comment. And if you can personally quote it, you get people that make you feel uncomfortable. You know how important this is. And it's very difficult for those that have not. But for me, it's very personal. That's why I take this very seriously. Because when I was growing up, shortly after the war, we did the projects. I wondered why people always attacked me, literally, physically. It took me a while until I was even in high school before I realized it was because it was after the war, and I was an American and Japanese descent. And even though in the projects, my father was military intelligence, he worked for the armed forces, he was military intelligence, they still didn't matter. And if you've never had that happen to you, and you don't know why people are bullying you, you have no idea, it's because back then it was easy. Most of the bullying started because of your race or your social economic position. But now, it's because you're different, as with gays, because you're doing things. Now it's even more than that, because I don't like you. And they do things, and cyberbullying becomes, is a very serious, I hate to say it, but it's very serious. It's causing things to happen in our society that didn't happen before. You handle things differently back then than you do today. And today, because it's more tragic, more people are looking to, to get their anger and their frustration out. And so we have to take this very seriously. It starts from kindergarten and young. It doesn't all of a sudden in high school you decide. These things are progressive. And until we really work with our children early on and explain to them, it's okay to step in and say no. It's okay to step in and say, I'm not going to let you do that. It's okay. I think what Carol was trying to say. It's okay. When I was growing up, it was very difficult. And back in those days, after a while, when you found out why they were doing it, sometimes you got aggressive back. And, and it got you in a lot of trouble as well. And I had my share of trouble. But I think it's imperative for us as adults to really, every time we get an opportunity to express to the children how important it is to not do that and to stick up for people who are being bullied. It's not acceptable, period. And I don't know how we do that. It's better when you're younger. It's easier when the children are younger. As you get older, they watch TV and they call you a snitch and they do all that stuff. So if you train them when they're young, it's like anything else. When they get older, I think they have a different perspective. And that's how we have to do it. And, and I think Michael's very, very, uh, it's very important. Uh, some of us have had experiences uh, with those things and not knowing why. You, you, you become an adult and was a adult before you realize why people were saying things about you, picking on you, and, and making you feel uncomfortable. But I've seen it. As a matter of fact, a couple of times you become just like that. It's like a pecking order. Okay? And in the projects, I was a low man on the totem pole. 
not because of anything I did, but because of what I learned. And we have to be very careful how we do things with children. Okay? So uh, this is extremely important to us. And I think it should be extremely important to all of you in the audience there that we take this seriously. Because unless you felt it, okay, it's not as important. Some of us are lucky enough not to have felt that. But if you've ever felt that kind of hate for you and you don't know why somebody hates you, you've done nothing to them, and yet they're picking on you. So I learned when I got to junior high finally, that, that's all of that thing, bodyguard, the old bodyguard with the guy, the big, biggest guy to hang out with, and because that's what I had to do. Eventually what I had to do in junior high is I hit, I was a jock and athlete, smaller, but then I hung around with all the big guys, and it stopped. And we shouldn't have to do that. Children shouldn't have to go out and see things. We should be stepping in and intervening on those, on behalf of the kids, all kids. All kids. So I say that. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, uh, Carol, Lucy, and Gary, for doing this. Okay, just I think one more uh, question, John. Yeah, quick question. So um, it looks like this uh, presentation was probably from a training that you guys did. So have, have you guys had training for the staff or is there a plan for doing training for the staff on bullying? Um, I think the plan is to maybe work with the principals. Okay. And at this moment in time, I would foresee using those the trifolds, um, the cyber tips, um, the digital pieces, both the anti-bullying and the maybe the digital, uh, what did you call that one? The digital, digital, digital citizenship. And trying to get those pieces planned throughout the year. And um, then what I would also like to do is find, um, I don't know if you remember when Jane Campbell was here, but for the tobacco piece, she always found those one or two liners about something finding that for, for the bulletin and then and making a concerted effort to get that in and then having them work with their teachers to figure out a way they're going to um, um, really guarantee it gets to the kids. Um, because that, that, that can sometimes, there's just sometimes, you know, that, that little glitch in the communication. And so, and, and maybe when we get to decide on the program, then there'll be a lot of training. Um, because I don't think you can implement those programs without training. Right. I guess that's, that was my yes. question. I mean, it, obviously, if this is really important, then right. I would think yes. we'd want to roll this out Absolutely. in some kind of a, a planned and right. uh, strategic um, manner yes. to, to the staff so that they're all trained. Yes. And, and sometimes the training is fairly straightforward and easy, like um, Second Step provided, at the time I bought it, VCR tapes that had training for those lessons and how you did it and why it was important. Okay. And you didn't have to bring in a trainer. Okay, well, I mean, it all sounds like you guys could do the training. Well, right, can I, exactly. Can I speak that, Mr. Hardy? Actually, this was kind of a compilation from existing efforts that uh, uh, Carol and others brought forward, you know, some, some, you know, working with our colleagues here, and we kind of gleaned this information, kind of put it together. Amazing to see coincide with the responsible process system. So we did do, we had an effort at the middle school for the entire district. And, and we had maybe 30 or 40 people, a little bit disappointing. But what we found out, we did have some people come in and present for us. But it was really not really tailored to meet a particular audience in our community. And after they stopped, it was amazing the answers and the interaction with Deputy Vasquez, Mr. Carroll, myself, and some of the others. We were able, I think there is, we always need to be learning, but it was amazing how well we could actually uh, uh, talk on behalf of the interests and concerns here. Okay, um, last, uh, Kathy, you had a question? I did, I had a quick question. Um, I'm just wondering if there would be, when you get to do all your training, if there would be an opportunity to get information like this out to the parents. I know that you had the training, but some parents at the end of the evening, they can't get their excuses, excuses, whatever. You know, but um, maybe send home a flyer of, you know, what the different bullying things are, um, hotlines that you have that parents can call, who they specifically can call for each school site, you know, or where their student could go to. You know, maybe they don't feel like talking to the principal, but maybe maybe list um, different people in the school that they would be willing to 
talk with them if they could have that feedback. Those are great suggestions, actually. Yeah. Oh, oh, Chris, I just wanted to um, just to piggyback on some of the comments that um, Mr. Mayetta um, shared. That um, there was there been speaking to your question, John, about uh, or Mr. Gardy, excuse me, about training. Um, we did have a, a really really uh, good preliminary, probably a three-hour champs training at the middle school, and I think probably almost all of Scott's staff was trained, and then each of, the, uh, each of the elementary principals came and brought a staff member with us. Uh, Diana and I, uh, then also, and Gary was with us, we visited Sound, uh, Isabel Middle School, so to speak to your question, uh, Mrs. Rangel, we don't have to go too far. Isabel Middle School is doing an outstanding standing job implementing CHAMPS. We were very impressed and we got really excited and pumped up. So um, we really want to support the efforts that um, I know Scott is uh, wanting to do in implementing CHAMPS and I think it would behoove us to kind of be really consistent. And if our children at the elementary uh, are trained in CHAMPS, it's, and it's really not, it's not a program, it's really a philosophy. And it starts with not just, you know, it encompasses the bullying, but it's that whole philosophy of creating a very, very positive environment, an inviting environment, a place where students want to be, where parents feel welcome, where, you know, folks feel welcome, uh, where students take pride in who they are and being at their school, uh, being at the Isabel Middle School. They have beautiful hallways, clean banners everywhere. It, it, it's about creating that, um, making your school be like the Magic Kingdom, you know, in Disneyland and being excited to be there. When you think about folks that work at Disneyland, what do they have? They have a smile on their face. And so it's this whole philosophy. So I would love for, um, you know, uh, board members to, I would like to do another visit to Isabel. And he's very welcoming, the principal there. And um, he's really turned things around there. So very impressive. Good to hear. And uh, Tricia does make a distinction there that is true. We need to get the bullying, the, you know, the no tolerance for bullying message out there, but it's the social skills program we're, that, that, that we're talking about. There, it's not really anti-bullying programs. There's anti-bullying information and what the consequences are and, and getting that information out there, but there's also then the social skills program the social skills, not even programs, but just as she said, that philosophy in our schools that we really haven't um, pushed as much lately. We, all the schools have sort of done all these different things. It hasn't been a systematic, cohesive uh, approach. approach. And that's why I think we want to really make good choices that we know we can implement and not just get something in just to do it. Just to do it. Okay, just a couple more comments. Yeah. I did have a question. I know in looking kind of at what programs are going to be put in or what programs are going to kind of be put into place, how much um, interaction has gone on or communication with our students regarding what they feel they might need? Because I think what our elementary students may say or our middle school students may say they need is going to be significantly different than what our high school students are saying. And I think if we're going to meet their needs, we need to hear it from them versus what us as adults, because bullying is not the same as what we say right. bullying is. Last okay. comment? I just would like to see a special twist for our special education students. They tend to be there on the bottom of the pecking order, and they get subtle and not so subtle bullying, and then they turn around and in their midst are looking at who can they right. lord it over. and. You know, I do my best to stop that within my groups, but I think it's kind of pervasive, and I've seen it in middle school also. Right. Okay. All right. Some follow-ups to work on. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So next. Yes. Uh, again, like like Lydia, this next report is something that uh, I believe the board also need to be uh, updated on. I'm sure you've heard of ACES, uh, but uh, the emphasis that we're going to provide tonight is really impressed upon you that this is a huge program in our district. 
Uh, we have around 450 students involved uh, with ACES. It's you know, K through middle school. We also have 21 adults responsible for running this program. Uh, we have those students, 450 of them, from anywhere from three to four hours a day, up to six o'clock in the evening. We receive from the state uh, a little over $500,000 to run the program. And they're very tight in terms of accountability. They review the program, they visit it, and they are very particular as to what they require in order to maintain quality in the program. And so, you know, again, uh, when Carol retired last year, we knew that this program was a massive one. It's almost like a school, you know, uh, an elementary school. And so uh, we've asked her to assist us also. Uh, the Gary comes in brand new into it, that we needed somebody who had the expertise in making sure that the program continues with the same quality that she had uh, left with her imprint on it. And so this evening, you will get an update uh, from Gary and Carol regarding ACES, how the program is going, and uh, again, give you an idea of how useful this has been to us as a district. So Carol, Gary. Um, as Mr. Johnson um, shared, we have a coordinator at each site and then 17 activity leaders that work with students directly. And, it's, and the, the law states that it's from any time school gets out until at least 6 o'clock at night. So our program runs until 6 o'clock at night. Many times the staff members are there with only a custodian. Many, many times the principals are there, but sometimes they're not, and they're not always available. So they really are on those campuses, you know, working this on, on, on putting this program and keeping this program together on their own um, for many, many long, late hours. Um, the purpose and objective to the after school program has changed over the years. When we first started, it was called after school and it has been around many years before that. Um, and then they decided to call it extended learning, and now the latest thing hot off the press is expanded day. And with every one of those name changes, philosophies about the program have changed. And, um, and expectations change. We're in the, um, we're in the second year of a three-year cycle. Next year, um, the person sitting in this seat will be writing a new plan for the after school program. The plan is really in depth. When And I, I've never really shown you the plan, but there are 40 assurances that the state asks you to meet. And, of the, and those 40 assurances are, every one of those 40 assurances is addressed in the plan in depth and in detail. Um, so it's quite an extensive plan to write. Um, so moving on, anyway, I, I wrote the plan last time, and in this packet I included the goals, um, the vision and the goals that were in place at the time I wrote the plan, which was the two, three, two years, three years ago, three years ago, because I did write it the year before. So, um, and at that time, the state was pretty well funding plans that were in place. Programs that were in place, the state was funding. So it, it funded our, our plan, no problem, and I met all of those goals and, and got my paperwork in. Everything was fine. The, the things they ask, the expectations they ask always change year to year. They never expect the same thing. But some of the, and I did put a little history in how long this has been in the district, and it did come into the district. We started to bring it in in 2005. Um, we went up to Sacramento, we, got, we put in our initial grant, we started that program in February of 2006, and it's been in place to this day. The first time it was in place, the first three years it was in place, we were fully funded. At that point in time, they looked at our attendance and reduced us to the amount that we could sustain with that attendance. So we lost money um, for the program 
because we didn't have 150 students at the middle school and we did not have um, 100 students at Pine River. We just didn't have those numbers. So it, it reduced our base on our grant. Um, Piru eventually was received, we, we applied for uh, what they call another universal grant to get back some of the money we lost at Piru because they could get more um, students back in their program. And so we did get a little, we recouped a little of the money back that way, but the grants are now highly competitive. I applied for one for the middle school, funding an extra person, trying to get a lot more kids into the, you know, putting a lot more kids in the program to pump up the attendance and we were not funded for that grant. So we did not recoup the loss at the middle school. Um, that's sort of the history. Um, we have, we have, there's accountability that they ask you to, um, to meet. And I listed some of those we have to account for our expenditures. But the big one is the attendance report. It's due twice a year. You are not in good standing if you miss those reporting periods. And if you are not in good standing, they will not fund your grant. So you don't want to ever not be in good standing. Um, with CSTs, we had an academic report that was due every year on a spreadsheet. Um, now they're just going to ask for, I think, attendance and a few other things because of the fact that the CSTs are not happening. Um, we do an annual survey of parents, students, teachers, and then try to incorporate whatever their issues are into training for the staff. Um, or we talk, uh, talk to principals about issues, whatever we need to do, we, that's how we use the, the uh, surveys. Um, and then the county slash state, because there's a person that is at the county, but he really works for the state somehow. So he kind of works for both. Um, every year they come out and they do a walkthrough of the program to see if we're meeting the expectations of the program. <coughs> and this year Gary organized it and scheduled the walkthroughs and they, the, the staff um, um, came together and we wrote the, the paperwork. It's extensive. There are questions that I just shake my head about that. You know, what is your RTI plan? <laughs> I think mean, nobody they're asking those poor kids at the after school board about their RTI plan. But it was a little kind of comical, but we address it. And um, they got together and we, we addressed it all together and they were really good about writing it up. And that was one of our staff development days because it takes that much, um, it just takes that intense focus to make that happen. And, um, and they don't, you know, so they need help with what the vocabulary and the language and the how to word things and all of that. And that was, that was a great um, thing to go through. Um, so, and Gary's been handling that. And then the county slash state person will bring in other two people with him and they'll do informal walkthroughs so that they have a pretty good idea of what our program looks like. Our program is, is one of the few that is actually run by the district. We may be one of two. Uh, there may be another one out there, but we are there. There, districts don't run these programs. They have a community-based organization running them, or, or um, of one sort or another. We're 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 very different in that we, as a district, are running that program, and it it, it does take a lot of resources on the part of the district. Did you have a yes, yeah, speaking about resources, so I guess my question was, um, how, how do we typically run? Does this encroach on the general fund at all? Do we, no. are we usually, are we exactly, you know, our expenditures meeting our, our revenues? You, you, this is one of those grants that you have to spend every single penny. You cannot carry anything over. So every year we make sure every single penny is spent. Okay. Um, it's funny you should ask that question because the one thing I think people don't understand about the grant. That grant, and I don't care what year you started the grant in, in 2002 it was $7.50 a child. That amount has not changed. There is no indication that amount will ever change. Now keep in mind 2002 to 2014. So, you know, you, you, your, your, your cost of doing business changes and changes fairly quickly. Um, so, 
there, and, the, and you can't get rid of staff. You can't cut the program. There's no way to cut the program. The, the law is 20 to 1. The rules are 20 to 1. If you don't have 20 to 1, you then you don't have a program, basically. So, um, it, it, so yes, the fin there are financial challenges to this program that um, impact, that can impact the program. And certainly with the new laws, being passed, the Obamacare, the health care issues, a lot of those things, there's a, there's a, 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 uh, there's a very good chance that those will impact the program financially. What those ramifications are, I don't know at this point, but certainly <coughs> something that you um, could be aware of. So there are, I, I mentioned the 40 assurances, the main ones that, that I deal with in the program are like the 20 to 1, um, that the students need to be there every day, that you can only count them there if they're there for 90 minutes. Um, you know, we have to have an early um, start, um, early release late start policy, which I provide <coughs> to you. And when the auditors come in, what we said in that policy is what they want to see. We had we had a leeway to write our policy under the assurances. In other words, they have to spend 15 hours at the program. But if they left at 5 o'clock or 4:30, as long as they were there 90 minutes, you know, their they, their attendance counts. But they still have to have the 15 hours. And so I included that with yours so that you could see what our, our policy was as far as the program goes. Um, and if, if parents, like catechism's a big issue in, in this community, and we've made arrangements through um, an early release form that parents can fill out so that we don't get dinged when we release our kids for that, that for catechism at that time of year, because it, it does happen and there are, it does impact the program. And rather than have to count them absent, we just have this form filled out saying, this is what we're doing, and we keep it on file. Um, the district does have to provide some kind of in-kind um, amount, and if it's one-third of the grant, it's a hefty amount. So what, what, what would one-third of 500 and 6,000 be, right? It's 100 and something, I think, 170, 160. But, um, so that's a huge in-kind, and um, I, I, I struggle with it every year. Um, I've never asked the district to put in any real monetary um, pieces, but we do get our snack through our, our free services, and we paid, in the past we paid for part of it, but there certainly was a great amount that was not um, something we paid for. So we could put that into in time. We have custodians on the campus. We have our principals there on the campus. Um, facilities are there. So I've used those pieces as our in kind match. Our technology, we had one of the tech guys come and make sure everybody had their email and could get on. And you know, so. So through those, um, our, the health um, nurse um, does the CPR training every year. So those are all in kind of pieces that the district uses um, to to meet that. And and we do need it. It it it, it's, it can be a struggle, but we, we get there with that. It's not an issue. Um, we do um, most years. Last year was just a little different. Part of it being the fact that I always did in-service or staff development for ACES on the same day the teachers did staff development. And we took those days back for teachers. And I didn't realize there's, a, there's a, something in the, the rules that govern the program where you can actually take a day of school and have the training on those days. So this year, I, I finally said I, I can't deal with this not having staff development and having to deal with all the other stuff. So we did we did take those days and we take three of them. So we had three days throughout the school year. We always put them right before a break. And it seemed to be just fine. There weren't complaints from parents. They just needed to know 
and they were ready to uh, go on their vacations a little early, and it was all fine with them for the most part. So we've done three big trainings this year, two 5.5 hour and a four hour, and then we always uh, have the ones right before school where they do the first day, first day then CPR. So we've done that. Um, we be, we're beginning to train on what Common Core is, and the after-school program has always been more hands-on, more thematic-based, and so they're feeling very comfortable with all of this. They went to the Edge Up conference in Epic County, and they were looking around going, we, we know this, we've heard this, this is great, you know, they were, they were very happy with that. Um, there are also things that the, the program's required to offer. It has to offer a homework slash tutoring time. It has to offer snack. Somewhere connected to that snack, they have to understand nutrition um, and, that, and that piece about healthy eating, um, enrichment activities, and physical activity daily. And we use Spark and Game Day for those, and also youth development. So we're talking about those social skill things. Well, youth development is a huge part of that. And they strongly encourage STEM activities, or STEAM now as it's known. And now I have another acronym with some other letter in there. And um, oh, and service learning projects. We've not been really great about the service learning projects, but they, 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 that's one of the areas of emphasis they would like to see us move to. Um, we've really focused on social studies and science as our thematic units. Um, I've, we've talked a lot this year about writing and would like to do a lot more with writing next year. Um, and then we we developed a plan for that five to six o'clock time when parents are pulling out kids. And so I believe at all sites now they have a tutoring time. They have their homework time. Now they have a tutoring time or a time for some kids that need more help with homework. And the other kids then get their choice time. So it seems to work out very well that way. Um, the next steps are uh, you know, I, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a new department at the CDE that's called Extended or Expanded Learning, and they put the after-school program into that department. They are looking at ways to um, kind of increase the potential of the program, is what I would say, through um, through the expectations they have. So, so in writing this next grant, it's going to be a little challenging because there's a lot of uh, things we'll have to address. And I think I was telling Mr. Johnson or somebody, I went to Sacramento and I read grants. I had to know what these grants were like. So I went to Sacramento, I was there for a week and I read 21st Century Grants, which is the federal version of the after school program. And the federal program has a rubric that you have to address and it is very comprehensive. And all of the people that I dealt with um, through the you know, email and things that help us in, in our district were there. And the message that I got was that you know, they are going to put something in place that is higher quality, that they really believe in this extended learning that, that, that they want to see kids in those programs doing these wonderful things related to science engineering, up-leveling the math, really doing the hands-on pieces. And I did get the feeling they were going to expect that next plan to address all of those. So I'm really glad I went to the grant. Uh, reading because I it was eye opening. So that's any questions from the board? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll leave it under the state. So you're you're saying that next year then we, the district needs to be thinking about the new plan right. that we're gonna have for this. Yeah. I know one of the questions that I get sometimes is I know that if the children are in the program 
like this year, they're automatically in it next year? Or how does that work? They, they, they are only, and there's a reason why I did it that way. I think some just, sometimes that's not the way it's done. But most of our kids meet the criteria most definitely. And the reason that we roll it over is because they have to meet that attendance requirement. And if you're spending that first month trying to get kids enrolled in that program, you lose all that attendance and we couldn't afford that in, in the beginning. So that's just the way I started to do it. And, and you know, and we do have criteria uh, in place that I'm, we, we have, I'm not sure has been fully implemented at all sites, mainly because we have waiting lists at just a few sites, not all sites. But if kids are missing days, and there's a waiting list, they can be certainly asked to leave the program. It's not something anybody likes to do. But there are rules for um, you know, people that are abusing the program, pulling their kids out early, and those sorts of things can be asked to leave. So there's a procedure in place for that if you need to. Could I just make one comment on that? Absolutely. Please, please. Um, I just I, I have to credit, I think it's already apparent, but I, I just want to credit Ms. Berenger when when I, when I attend the director's meetings now, um, there's not one director of an ACES program who works less than 50% just with ACES. Just with ACES. So the success of the program is just a tremendous amount of work that she's accomplished in terms of just providing a whole collection of, of project-based learning thematic units that are now so so uh, appropriate. Uh, that some of the topics of the training, high level, high caliber training, gone over Common Core. It is extended. It is no longer, it's not snack and nap time. It's really providing them with, you know, lessons on how to provide Common Core assessments. How to, last one, we had another uh, aspect. We had Jennifer Ware teaching ELD strategies for, uh, for after school. So we're trying to parallel for it. And, really complement and support the construction of class. And we had someone from the, uh, the intern from that was working with the special ed came in and did some ADHD training. Okay. And so now we're trying to um, pull in uh, resources because the, the kids in the program really need the information. They need the training. They're trying to look at the county for training a bit more. In, in conclusion, I just want to do a couple of things that I think uh, are significant for the board to take away with based on this presentation. Number one, we wanted to rest on the board that this was on the staff. And secondly, that it is not an adjunct program, but that we mirror what's going on in the regular program. And of course, with Carol's report, it says it's coming down the pipe it will have to be much more uh, aligned with what's going on in the classroom academic program in terms of the new applications that will be submitted uh, to the state in order to get the college. So those are the two takeaways. When, when will we place. begin to prepare for the new funding? I would suggest, the application process. Yeah, I would suggest the application process probably start to be delivered in the fall. And I highly recommend Carol to start working on that as soon as possible. She has the experience, she has the expertise, she knows what they're looking for. She's had the program for a number of years. So uh, I would suggest that we continue to ask her to play a major role in that aspect. I think we're doing a pretty good job, like you and Gary said. You know, the directors who are running this program for a long time. And we're kind of, you know, right now. Kind of doing the best we can in this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, item J, <coughs> consent items. Items on the consent agenda are considered routine and will be enacted by a single motion. None of the items will be discussed unless a board member or member of the audience requests discussion. Okay, I uh, need a motion. So moved. Okay. Second. Thank you. We moved and seconded to approve the consent items. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, I'm in the post. Okay, motion passed, five zero. Uh, next, item K is action item. 
uh, to approve the adoption of resolution number 13-14-5 for approval of assignments of teachers who are teaching outside of their credential authorizations or on an emergency permit. Okay, uh, so I need a motion for that. So moved. Thank you, Dave. Okay, move and second it to approve uh, this resolution 13-14-5. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carried 5-0. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 6, approve uh, adoption of resolution number 13-14-06 for layoff of classified employees. So moved. Okay. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Virginia, Virginia, thank you. Okay, discussion on this and Todd, could you uh, sure. review that, um, please? The resolutions for classified employees and um, item 1.1 and 1.2, the NFL, the Neighborhood for Learning Preschool Program, we have on our SESPE school campus. And um, the program is funded through first five and one of the requirements in order for us to continue receiving that funding is to align with the requirements of the program um, whereby the preschool teacher and the preschool um, IA um, have to have a certain certificate in order to um, receive the funding. Um, in this case, the current employees do not hold those certificates. Um, there's a caveat to this, and, and, and one is, um, my understanding is the, the IA, the individual that's holding that position, has um, some of the requirements, the AA degree and the hours of service, where she can possibly apply for the certificate. If she does that, um, we'll be able to continue with her in that position. Um, the current teacher does not hold the certificate and does not plan to uh, get that anytime soon. Uh, the nice thing is that we're in the process of capturing some funding. Uh, Briggs School declined funding. And so Cynthia, uh, uh, Patricia Cervantes, who's the director of the program, has put in to see if she can capture that funding and bring it to Fillmore, which would actually double the service that we currently have. If we're able to capture that funding, we'll be able to continue with the current employees and add uh, a new teacher with the site supervisor certificate. Um, so I'm hoping that we can, can pull those funds and capture them and expand our program and keep both of those employees. Um, but we're in the situation until we have those, those final numbers in place. Um, unfortunately, we have to take this action. Um, item 1.3, 1.4, and 1.5, those are all vacant positions. And we've uh, negotiated with CSEA. Um, um, one, the law position has been eliminated. Um, the, the clerk positions and food services we renegotiated. And there's a, a new position with a different title in that place. Um, and the purchasing clerk, account clerk, was actually negotiated as an upgrade. Um, we uh, reclassified that to an account clerk two, which is a higher classification. Um, and we've, we've already uh, hired staff in those positions. Um, and so we're getting those three, uh, the MAW coordinator, the clerk, and the purchasing assistant account clerk, just getting them off our books. They're vacant at the time. And we want to clean up so that we have a position control within our system that all current positions are filled and uh, cleans up our books. So that's the, the resolution is to do two pieces. I, I was going to ask, what, what, what kind of dollars are we getting? Is, is the NFL program? NFL. Yeah, what yeah, kind of program. dollars do we get there? I don't know the exact uh, dollar amount. Do you, do you have up to no. I, I I know it, it pays for the teacher, the IA, um, the in kind would be the facility, to use our facility. Um, Fantastic, and, and, and it also funds the director that is actually housed in Santa Paula, and there are also preschools in Santa Paula as well. Um, there was a point in time where uh, Santa Paula Elementary District was not able to continue with the amount of employees that they had, and we were able to 
fold that grant over and accept it here in Fillmore, which as you know, there's a high need for preschools in, um, in the community. And, and the goal would be to have all of our children in Fillmore attend preschool before kindergarten. So anything we can do to continue growing the program, growing yes. programs, whether it be through first five or, or other avenues, um, we want to continue. And that. NFL is a preschool program, and it's under the direction of the Fillmore Unified School District. Is that okay. correct? That's correct. It's, it's a program called Neighborhoods for Learning, right. funded by First Five. And the employees are the Fillmore Unified School District employees. Now, the, the other preschools in the community of Fillmore, do they have to meet these same requirements? Do you, do you have to know? Um, I mean, as a school district, we're having to, to be more stringent with us. Well, I, I'm just wondering if the federal, I assume they're federal for preschools. I can't speak for the private school. There's a preschool in town. Um, well, I'm I guess sure I'm the, zeroing in on the one over by St. Cayetano. Yeah, I'm sure they follow the same guidelines. That we're going to Yes, and if a private sector were to open a school, they would have to have a, the, the site supervisor is a, a, a licensed certificate that at least one individual has to hold at the site. Yeah. So and we can add teachers, right. but we have to have one certified site supervisor. Well, I'll, get, I'll get you an answer on Okay. okay, any other questions on that? No? Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve the adoption resolution. Resolution 13-14-06. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No? Okay, 5-0. Yes? Okay, uh, item L, future meetings. Um, John, you want to talk about the special meeting we're going to sure. be having? So um, it's not on, it's not on there, but it, it should be added. Uh, we're, we're having a special meeting on April seventh. Uh, three board members are flying up to uh, Natomas uh, School District near Sacramento uh, to uh, examine, I guess, the district from which we've got a candidate for superintendent. Um, and so that's going to be added on uh, to, the, to the list of uh, meetings. So it will be an all-day thing. Uh, the three board members that are going will be myself. Tony Prado and uh, Lucy Rankin. And uh, since uh, there's, there are three of us attending, the, there will be an agenda posted um, within the time limit for you. And then uh, we also then, when we get back, we'll be uh, calling another a special meeting in order for us to debrief with the other two board members of, of the information that we obtained about this particular candidate. And, uh, and then hopefully uh, everything works out the way it should on April 15th, our next scheduled um, regular board meeting. Uh, we will be announcing our uh, new superintendent and um, hopefully they will be here too so that uh, he, can be in, he or she can be introduced to the public. Um, do we want to set that? meeting now because otherwise um, well yeah I, mean, I, I think sure. well, well we have to debrief we right. have to debrief as far as what we for that, well, for that information yes that we obtained so if it's on the 7th meeting. so the next day is the 8th uh, uh, that's a, the next that's a Tuesday and that meeting we have the LCAP meeting don't we at that time so that would be bad so the 9th or the 10th Wednesday or Thursday would be good for us to meet and then either approve or not approve the candidate. Okay, so I'm, I'm good with either day. Okay, Tell Virginia, do you have a preference? Wednesday. Wednesday for best, so is the 9th okay with everybody? Yep. Okay, so we will put down April 9th as a special meeting for uh, which would be closed session. Okay, and now the other? The, uh, technically speaking, the Thomas meeting is it considered to be closed or open? Um, it will be open with, we'll set the agenda for the day and then we will, in closed session, we will have a discussion with subgroups from that uh, community uh, for us to ask questions, make sure we have the right information on our candidate. Well, 
the, the reason I'm asking is because it's, it's going to be posted here in Fillmore. In Fillmore and, 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 and over there. In, yes. And in, and in, in the board, yes. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, so then we also have then April 15th, which uh, will be the day then that uh, we announce our superintendent, hopefully, and then May 6th would be the following one. Uh, yes. Just for clarification, uh -huh. did you say that the, uh, the sessions at the Thomas were going to be closed? We open it up as a public meeting because it is a, uh, a, notice meeting. a notice meeting, yes. And then we will uh, move to go into closed session. And during closed session, you'll see on the agenda that it's listed <coughs> we'll be meeting with uh, various groups. Various groups. Uh, of that uh, that district, and uh, we will be there approximately 9:30 to about 4:30, and uh, so we'll gather information. Then. It's it's closed session because we're going to be discussing personnel. Personnel. Person yes, personnel. Right. Okay. Any questions from anyone? Okay. Um, so. Any uh, closing uh, comments of, of uh, board members or agenda building items? Dave? Well, I'm kind of interested in Carol and in your program. If we could have some updates or Gary, you know, on the building and um, issue and even with the ACES program. Because yeah. that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're doing. Yeah. All right, uh, Virginia? Uh, so uh, just to follow up on, uh, I'd ask for uh, a report regarding the 58 students and what the plan is to address their needs. So um, I assume, Dr. Machino, that we're going to have that presentation at the next meeting. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, Tony? Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. One is uh, kind of piggybacking on what John was talking about, those 58 students. Uh, I just want to make a comment that I remember speaking to... Uh, Mr. Torres, Happy, Happy. Torres. Happy uh, when these seniors were freshmen, I remember him making a comment at, not back to school night, but open house, which is held in the spring. And the comment that he made to me back then was that we had a group of freshman students where half of them were failing half their classes and that they were not on schedule in any way shape or form to graduate now this is as freshmen as freshmen I think you predicted four years in well, well based on the uh, semester grades the, the uh, fall semester grades that we had such a high D and F rate at that time and he also made the comment that we had a group of sophomores that were not doing very well, and that was going to become an issue. And if, if at all possible, in any way, shape, or form, I would like to have uh, Mr. Torres address the board if he was willing to, if we could contact him and see uh, how far off my comments are in relation to this particular issue. Anyway, I, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, idea only because, again, we're concerned about these 58 students that are not, that are uh, in danger of not graduating and to kind of look at their history as to what, who they were and where they were their freshman year. And this, I don't know if we can address it, but the sophomore group that they just graduated. Well, my, my daughter was in the sophomore group, so I can, yeah. I can tell you quite a bit about that class. So. Okay. Well, the, the other thing is uh, I had requested a few board meetings ago about some information regarding school farm. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, budget, in terms of uh, the organization, how does the advisory group operate? 
and we haven't gone anywhere with it, and I haven't heard anything. So I'm just wondering if we could give some kind of a report <coughs> on what, what goes on at the school farm, and how is it organized, and what is their budget, and some of their expenditures. They're willing. To, I brought this up to the council. They're willing to. Yeah. To come no, I, I know. So it just you know the budget thing it needs to come from right. the officer. That's why I'm bringing it up. Okay. Okay, well, if we, we have that plan maybe for the, uh, for the the seniors, that issue on the 15th, and maybe that first week in, uh, the first meeting in May, then we could try to get the, uh, the, the school farm on them. Okay. Okay. Could I make a clarification on um, Tony's years? Tony, I think you're talking about the sophomores now being the class of 2014, because in 2015 we had 99th graders who came to us from the middle school who had not promoted. So I think you had, you're oh, yeah. here off. So it's the class of 15 where yeah. we had everybody failing. The class of 14 right. is this current class, right. yeah. the sophomores. Yeah, I remember those 90 middle school. Yeah. Okay, um, any other comments or agenda building? No? Okay, if not, then someone does that. Thank you, Virginia. Second? Second. Thank you, John. All those in favor of returning the meeting? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed?